in preparation for all of this, uh, I suddenly realized that I am the 50th president of the Sound Company. I feel, I feel this tremendous, overwhelming feeling of, of the history that's in this building and those who have come before us and what a responsibility it is to carry this forward. I think it's really important and embrace all of this for the future. So we are gathered here this evening to celebrate art in this beautiful house and to exercise a time-honored tradition of presenting the Sound of Gandhi Medal of Honor to a deserving recipient. And tonight, that will be John Stobart. He's an incredible artist, a wonderful person, and he's the founder of the Stobart Foundation which are all requirements to get this award. <laughs> Thank you for that. So welcome, John, and all of you who have come to celebrate here with him. Presently, I'm surrounded by one of the finest boards of trustees, and many of you are here tonight. Tim Newton, our chairman. Spencer, our first vice president. John Morehouse, our treasurer. Paul Stockslater, our financial committee chair. Roger Rossi, our corresponding secretary. Rich Seymour, our recording secretary. And the other left-handed Bob, Bob Muller, our curator. Robert Danko, our library chair. I guess you've been up to the uh, second floor and seen what's going on. Uh, Mohammed Youssef, our house committee chair. And if you would stand for a moment, Charles Yoder, our Chairman of the Art Committee. I really appreciate the, the, the phrase, but I, I really would like the, the Art Committee that's here, and most of them are here, just please stand up. I want you to see the people who have hung this show, and it's the greatest team. Special welcome this evening to Ruth Weidenhaus, President of Americas, and the first woman president of the Sound of America. We're also joined by Ed Brennan, who is President and Chairman Emeritus. And 
my predecessor and teacher of this job, Claudia Seymour, President Merrill. And Pamela Singleton, Chairman of Americans. I'd also like to welcome Grace Volpe, wife of former President Robert Volpe. And Marianne former, uh, former President Mark Hannon, wife of President And to join John Stobart this evening, we have previous, previous some of any medal recipients who are here with us tonight, Ruth Riding House, 1989. Ed Brennan, 1993. Alex Kaplan, 2008. And Pamela Singleton, 2012. Okay. Now, I need you all to work with me on the next task. I need you to relax, I need you to enjoy each other's company, and have a wonderful dinner, and we will reconvene after dessert and Thank you. We gather here tonight as heirs of a small group of artists, and art lovers who founded the Salma Bennett Club in 1871. We are the beneficiaries of their amazing vision and their success as artists. These artists and collectors bought this building in 1917. The history of the Salma Gundy Club that was done by William Henry Sheldon in 1917 has the history of the club from 1871 up through 1917. And at the very end of the book, there is a section, the appendix. We're living in the appendix. <laughs> it's a great story, and it says in 1917, the Salma Gundy Club bought the house at 47 Fifth Avenue, which stands at the center of the block between 11th and 12th Streets and opposite the old First Presbyterian Church. This house was built by Irad Hawley, who was then president of the Pennsylvania Coal Company, and I Broadway, it goes on. The purchase price of the property was $75,000. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, that was a lot for them. And instead of bonding the club, the sum, of, the sum was raised by voluntary contributions from the layman and by a sale at auction of paintings contributed by artist members. The cash contributions amounted to 25382 and the pictures bought brought, brought 21189 providing a purchase and building fund of $46,571. Now this is, the, this is the next best part. Extensive repairs were undertaken including new construction on the entire unoccupied lot so that as and then although the club took possession on the 1st of July the house was not occupied until nearly Christmas while work on the interior was still in progress the key phrase there including construction on the entire unoccupied lot we're standing on the unoccupied lot so the building stopped at the header right there. You see the tracery on the ceiling. That was the original dining room in the rear of the house. So that was the rear of the house. Mm -hmm. And in 1917, when we bought the building, this was the garden, this and the, the area below us. So they built the, the uh, game room and the social area where the pool tables reside, and they created this gallery. So this. The book, as it, as it says, uh, is the, that, that's the appendix. Well, the appendix has a, a life and a future of its own. I think that we can say that we have been good heirs, good stewards of what our artist ancestors built here in the backyard of 47th Fifth Avenue. I'm thinking they would be very pleased with our stewardship of their building. This magnificent state of the art.
This magnificent, state-of-the-art gallery helps to assure the prominence of the Salma Gundy Club for decades into the future. I don't know what I love the most, whether it's the quarters on oak floor, whether it's the, the great wall coverings, the beautiful cove that's been completely redone, the glass ceiling, the, the very hidden air conditioning and heating that emanates from these little slots that you see right here at the corner of the cove at the top. Those slots are the source of our air conditioning and heating. Now I realize that you may miss the air conditioners that came through the wall over there. And, and, I do! <laughs> There's one in every crowd. <laughs> and the, the radiators, we used to get the set on. We had no radiators to set on. But they're gone. And um, we're, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I love the most. I, I just love this. Come over here. Thousands of hours, thousands of hours have been poured into this project by dozens and dozens of people. And hundreds of thousands of dollars have been given generously by the Manton Foundation, the New York State Dormitory Authority, American Masters, Sylvia Gleesman, the KT Whiteman Foundation, and hundreds and hundreds of generous givers who've given sacrificially, who's given, who have given generously. We're still not paid for, but we've had great success in the giving, and um, we are completely grateful. Of those thousands of hours that have poured into this place, tonight we want to recognize one of the many who have labored tirelessly on our behalf. Lisa, would you come up? She is the architect for this project. And tonight, she and her husband, Peter, have graciously offered to spend their 20th wedding anniversary with us. I have to say, Lisa has won my heart. You know, and congratulations to you for having such a prize in your life. Uh, she has uh, she's been extraordinary, and uh, she said at dinner tonight. You know, we were talking earlier today. We were here to meet with the builder, as we do every Wednesday, and uh, uh, you know, she was referencing. You know, we were earlier here today. We were in jeans, going through the punch list. She said, particularly to Peter Trippy, she was saying. Uh, you know, when the, the contractors are always fearful when she shows up wearing a baseball cap and jeans because they, they know there's going to be hell to pay somewhere in there. So, uh, uh, thanks for that tip, by the way. So, um, she designed this gallery, you know, in, in the restoration of what was here and the thoughtful considerations to bring it to its current state. And uh, she's clearly done an extraordinary job for the Salma Gandhi Club. Um, Lisa, um, your extraordinary talent, your wisdom, your loyalty, you have helped to ensure our glorious future that we are, we're not just the appendix to the book, but we are we're beginning a great future now again, continuing what our forebears have begun here in this place. Thank you very much, Lisa. with a, it's a, uh, a hand-done uh, woodcut by Liam Lockridge, obviously the facade of the club. And, uh, <laughs> I asked her if there's anything she wanted to say, but uh, she preferred. So, uh, happy anniversary, guys. Uh, <laughs> Well,
what a great night, you know, and, and, and what better than to honor one of the greats of the art world. Um, it is an honor for me tonight to introduce one of my dear friends, who will in turn introduce one of my dear friends. Don Mers is going to introduce John in a few moments. Don Mers has been an incredible friend to the Sal Magundi Club. He is a world-class artist in his own right, and Don has given generously to the club. His contributions total many tens of thousands of dollars that he has graciously shared with us in the general fund, in the building fund. Uh, thank you for that, Don. Um, Don's a quiet man. Are you quiet? <laughs> Maybe not. He has his moments. But Don is one of the most, he's, by the way, this piece, uh, right behind Russell Janishian. Would you point to that, Russell? This is Don's piece here in the member show, a real stunner, low tide. Thank you, Don. Um, but Don is, uh, in addition to being a spectacular artist, uh, world class, he is one of the most eloquent speakers that I know. Don, I give you the honor of introducing our mutual friend. You have set a high bar for me, Tim. I hope I can live up to it. It is a real joy to be here among esteemed colleagues and some Gundians and friends and acquaintances. It really is a true joy. It's also a joy for me for sentimental reasons because I've been friends with John for many, many years and I'll get to a little bit of that biographical uh, line uh, at the end of my remarks. Um, it's also a great privilege to be able to uh, introduce John because he is one of the giants in our field. The, um, we didn't really plan this, um, but there's a historical theme going to each of uh, both Bob and you, Tim, and now I'm going to refer to this place in terms of some historical context and perspective. Um, and I don't mean atmospheric perspective or linear perspective, I mean human perspective. Um, the, John is so well known that his, bi his biography, his resume, his accomplishments is very well published, very well documented in many of his fine texts and other publications. So I'm going to Leave that to John, because God, does he love to tell those stories. Uh, and I, I want to I touch upon something that's occurred to me recently, because this is such a venerable, hallowed place that we're standing in. And as I was thinking about this, I don't know what call it. There's one thing that I think is so heartwarming and so enriching, is that we are all here for a common reason. We, besides our affection and respect for John, we all adore visual arts. We are our brethren, and we've had the opportunity for our lives to coincide. And while we're here in this lifespan, we exchange and interact, and we spend our lives together loving art. And it's an incredibly heartwarming thing to be able to do. And um, it's, it's beneficial on so many, so many levels, personally, professionally. This is our world, this is our family. And every now and then I like to take stock of my life and, and, uh, and the circumstances I'm in. And just take a moment, take a breath, and look where you are and say, wow. And tonight is one of those nights. It's a poignant evening for all of us. Um, I, I think many of you probably have art libraries and you love to look through the old books and look at these sepia tone photographs of gatherings such as this. And I, I, threw, I threw a few names out. Members like, minor members like William Merritt Chase or Child Hassan, Thomas Moran, Gordon Grant, Dean Cornwell. These artists inhabit this room, this, this, this building for fellowship, for camaraderie, for professional exchange. And I always look at these black and white or these sepia color photographs and say, gosh, if I only could have been in that room with them, I wondered what they'd say to each other. I wondered what they were talking about. I know they were smoking cigars <laughs> uh, and drinking whiskey. But there's this uh, kind of romantic timing for what happened then. So those photographs have now been relegated to art history. But the antecedent to art history is art in the present. And guess what? You're in it. We're in it right now. We're inhabiting this room with some brilliant practitioners and with some giants, one giant in particular. So even though some, we're not sepia color yet, 
<laughs> we're in full color and we're fully present to hear, to, to continue that, to, to, to be part of that continuum before we move on. Hundreds of years from now, when people, when our successors are looking at this and saying, my word, that was John Stobart sitting at that table, and who were the people that were with him? Who was that man with that shocking white hair and that magnificent mustache? <laughs> <laughs> I want to put John's work into a context, within this context. There are many of you here tonight who are practitioners. There are, there are, there are painters, sculptors, print painters. There are collectors. There are fine dealers. There are scholars. There are writers. All of us are in service to and stewards of this art form that we so I want to reference the practitioners uh, in illuminating all of us as to a perspective about what John has done. As I said earlier, we're, all, we're sharing our life stand together. Our lives have coincided. Uh, we share our work. We, we criticize one another. We praise each other. We applaud one another. And when our life spans are finished and our work is done, for the most part, the majority of us will have been known as artists of our time. And our work will be known as art of our time, of that particular time. However, among those ranks, there are a few brilliant geniuses whose work is so singular, who's so definitive, so influential, so important, that the work transcends the limitations of art of that particular time. That's not an artist of their time. That is an artist of all time. And John Stobart's work the volume of his work, the intensity of his work, the contribution he's made has raised him to that upper echelon of being an artist of all time. And you'll notice I didn't say marine artist, because John is more than a marine artist. Of course, he's devoted the bulk of his career to maritime subjects, but John needs no caveat, no qualifications. He's a brilliant painter. Uh, and let, he's, he's contributed to landscape painting, plein air painting, the education of the young, philanthropy through foundation, through uh, scholarships. John has embraced the artist of, of a, of the life of a giant artist in all respects. And that's why I, he deserves and his work, his work will, tr will, uh, will transverse centuries. It'll be in museums and institutions for centuries to come, and deservedly so. So before I ask John to come up, I just want to explain why I'm up here. Um, <laughs> there must be a couple of people wondering why that guy. <laughs> um, I was first introduced to John Stobart's work when I was a very young man entering art school when one of that, that, that royal blue catalog from Maritime Heritage Prints arrived. And I opened that up and I was dumbfounded, I was enthralled, I was jealous, I was excited. I was so intrigued by what John did, I thought, this is remarkable. I've never seen anything like it. And I began to study, some would say stock, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to art school in Boston, and I went down to Lewis Wharf, where there was a gallery. And I stood at those windows and stared in at the prints and stared in at the paintings until finally the gallery manager said, would you please come in here and stop fogging up our windows? <laughs> so, I, uh, I entered and I began to study. Fast forward two years, I left art school. I was working as a deckhand on a small square rig ship. And I was informed one morning by the skipper that this uh, John Stobart was coming over from the film crew because they were doing a documentary. And would you like to show John around? So I had a knife on me and my hair was long and kind of scraggly. <laughs> um, John came aboard and I introduced myself and he couldn't have been more gracious, more kind, and I had the opportunity to kind of show him around the vessel while the filming was going on. Subsequently, I began to see John at shows in the Mystic Seaport Gallery, where Russ Venetian was the director for many years, and John was always gracious, supportive, he gave me direction, he gave me advice. He first was my hero, then he became my mentor, and then we became colleagues, and all along we were dear, he has never done anything but be supportive and encouraging. So if you go now to the last couple of years, besides this being one of the culminating moments in my career, I had a, uh, the opportunity, I was asked by John 
about three to four years ago. He had a major retrospective exhibition at the Four Arts Museum in uh, Palm Beach, which is a magnificent venue. And, they, and John asked me to write the forward for the catalog. And uh, in kind, two years later, when I had a one-person show in uh, Vose Gallery in Boston, I asked John to write my forward. So from a little kid who stared at the chain link fence looking at the guy in the big leagues, to finally become a colleague of his, someone whose advice I continue to seek and whose friendship I cherish. cherish. Um, those are the reasons that I'd like to think that I'm up here speaking for him. So. Incredibly, that um, I 
should mention. But first of all, I want to say that, um, that 30 years ago, I was very fortunate to meet somebody in Boston, who, a lady who was tied up with a lawyer that I was dealing with in some sort of a way, and, um, and Sandy, my manager. Such a help to me over the years, and um, and I don't know where I'd be today if it hadn't been for her. But she has been very powerful in guiding me and advising me, and she learned the whole thing about the art, and um, and is still there, and is still the mainstream of my operation, and um, and she. Um, just 10 days ago or so, she got the, the Business Woman of the Year um, award for, uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, from the State Senate. <laughs> so, that's just one person in the chain. I also had hoped that... Um, that uh, Oz Brett, who was an Australian artist, who lived out in Levittown and used to do things and, uh, for the Moran Towing Company, that's that sort of thing. I met him through a fellow called Peter Stanford, who was supposed to be at the table here. Peter Stanford developed the South Street Seaport from scratch. I met him in 1965 when I came to this country. And uh, when I came to New York from Canada, uh, it, it, I, I met Peter Stanford. He had the source of all the, the, um, the historic uh, information on the wolves I'd seen in the early days. And that was a bonanza for me. And uh, he helped me so much. And it's such a shame. His car broke down on the way here from Poughkeepsie and uh, wasn't able to be here tonight. And Oz Brett, an Australian maritime artist, he, who, the, he couldn't come because he fell, he's 90 something, and he couldn't be here. And he was the one, believe it or not, he used to go in sailing ships. Uh, he was a crew member on sailing ships uh, from uh, early days, uh, such as, uh, well, uh, when this would be 1950, um, that sort of time, there were still sailing ships running. He was on some of them, and he knew all about the sailing ships. And he was my source of information for things that I could do wrong. I always played everything by Oz. And Oz should be here tonight and hearing what I want to say about him, because he was an angel to me. He never failed, he delivered every time, and he was stalwartly behind me, and he deserves to be here. He deserved part of this. Um, Donald Holden, who, who I met on uh, coming from Canada, the very first time I came down from Canada, uh, when I decided to come to America after having that advice to come here and not get representation in Canada, I got a train and I, and I, um, I got a train ride and uh, I bought six canvases of clipper ships at sea which were developed with, with, with the curator of the Maritime Museum, Alan Howard. He, he gave me all the details of this and he helped me through the whole thing, helped me through all the rigging and was a fa fascinating person. I'm sitting on a train with me on a rack and uh, sleep on two seats and I wake up and I'm suddenly open the curtain and here is, and I've just seen that movie called North by Northwest with Harry Grant. <laughs> and I got it in the same place. I recognized it immediately. I was on the same rail line 
and going into New York, and it stopped in Irvington on Hudson. And, uh, and all these commuters got on, and I had to get up sleeping, and I had to get up, and so I sit there, you know, and somebody else sat beside me. And, uh, and then I thought, and I saw him looking at books on art and, and um, making notes, and um, I thought, gosh, I'd better chat this guy up. I had no idea where I was going. I knew I was coming to New York, but I had no address, no gallery name, no nothing at all. I was absolutely naked coming to New York. So um, he, uh, so I, I decided to introduce myself, and I said, I was a marine artist. As soon as I said that, he went, well, as if I'd stabbed him in the back. <laughs> and um, he, and eventually I got these four black and white uh, photographs of the things that were on the rack, and I, I, I put, passed them across to him, and he said, these are yours? I said, yes. I said, you did all the, you know, and he said, yes. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I uh, he uh, started to chat with me a little bit, and go, coming into Grand Central, and the reason that we had to stay in in uh, Irvington on Hudson was to get rid of the steam engine and put an electric engine to go to Grand Central. And so that was the reason by that. But anyway, he, as we got off the train, and we both went our separate ways in that big zoo where the, that wonderful thing, you know, this huge thing, Grand Central, was very impressive, I thought. And uh, I'd never seen that before. And uh, anyway, he, he wandered off, but he'd given me his card, and, and he'd given me a sheet of paper saying, this, 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 and this gallery would definitely be interested in my work. So I, I thought, well, I'd first go to the first one, which was right opposite the Plaza Hotel at the corner of the park, and I lugged all this stuff all the way up there, walked all that way, and, but just as he left me and went through this melee of people, I looked at the card and it said, Donald Holden, editor, American Artist Magazine. <laughs> so that's, that, how, how did that happen? I don't know how these things happen, but this is the sort of thing that's happened to me. My life has been punctuated by that kind of thing, that right at the crucial moment, some element will come in to guide me either that way or this way. And heaven only knows where that's coming from. But I feel, I've often felt there's somebody else in the loop. It can't be by chance alone. And I just, I'm not a real religious person. But there's got to be somebody eyeing me that puts me in the right spot at the right time. So that, that's thanks to Donald Holden. And... Um, and then there are, uh, that's about it for the people who have helped me with a great, a great deal. But without that, I don't think I would have made it to where I am. And uh, I'm very, very dedicated to art, culture, and, and the, well, the philosophy of drawing and painting. And I've always been very dedicated to that sense being a young person in England at a college of art in the Midlands and being shipped to a, a local museum like the one in Birmingham where there would be an exhibition of landscape painting and I always remember going to this one and, and stopping at a painting not that big it was one of John Constable's outdoor paintings, and uh, he painted regularly. His paintings were always done from life, and uh, and and uh, this painting, I was transfixed on it, and I I felt that uh, he was I was telling me something, and. Uh, and it was amazing how each was each each spontaneous brush stroke was fabulous, almost miraculously doing the painting. And even the ground of the painting was showing through all over in little spots. And uh, 
And I was just overwhelmed by that. And uh, I felt that he was saying to me, why are you getting so upset about this? I can do this. You can too, if I can. And that's the message that I took away from there, that moment. And, and, I, and I continued on. And uh, I went. I was in the. I went to the Royal Academy in London, Royal Academy Schools, which is a disaster now, by the way. <laughs> uh, heaven only knows how I can try and pull that back. We've tried to give them our scholarships, but they don't do representational painting anymore. They just do unrepresentational painting. But I, I feel that the culture of art is a stake, and I want to write a book. And I want to do uh, a really good book if I can. And um, I've got it all really prepared. It just needs doing. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to do it if I live through it. And, uh, and, uh, and it'll give all the aspects of all this and, and detail it all out and hopefully help restore, uh, to restore painting from nature and painting the thing you see, which is where the, the, the essence, in my view, of art is the, is what you, is the way you interpret that thing in front of you over here. It's not to, to try and get it photographic. You, you want to put in your personality, because it's your personality that should be in the painting. And it should be a painting that somebody sees and they say, oh, that's a stove art. You know, if, that's, if they say that, you're really on the right track. Because that is, is the recognizability of your signature of characteristics and the way you do it and the way you put paint on. That's where the magic is. And that's the thing that will, that will grow and be valuable. And, uh, and is the essential thing to, to what we're all hoping for. So that's the message I leave. And, and thank you very, very much um, that for this fabulous honor. And I, I, I feel I don't deserve it, but I'm, I'm very, very happy. Very, very proud. Chris told me he got some new running shoes that are awesome, so we appreciate all you do. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank uh, Dago, Dagoberto Chavez for putting together this whole conversation. And you make your dean, Marcel, who was here doing a wonderful job this evening, along with his staff. And uh, our dinner this evening by Chef Gerard, I think, was over the top. And uh, she didn't want me to say anything, but uh, I really appreciate my wife, Mae Green, providing table decorations for the uh, Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and every time that I leave this building, I always say to whoever's in front of me, I'll see you next time. Uh -huh.